Uh, Essie, ooh, there it went. Wow, I have a really good teacher's voice going there for a while. <laughs> Come bring it down now. Um, and then we will be hearing from um, members of SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, which is an organization of over 2 million members. So as I said, you have the contents of your packet at your seat. And then for the public, these materials will be posted online um, on our uh, education finance website. If you are looking, uh, members, if you are looking for these, uh, these uh, items in one place, they'll be attached to an email sent by my legislative assistant, Sammy. So you'll have those also electronically. So I think we will begin with um, some opening comments from our Education Minnesota members, uh, Caitlin Snyder and Sarah Burt. Members, if you have questions, let's wait till both of them are done speaking, and then uh, we'll give them a little bit of time if you do have any questions. And is this, let's see, do you have a, any slides or anything, or are you just speaking today? Just speaking. Okay, Madam great. Chair. So, um, Sarah, are you going to begin? Okay, Sarah, would you please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you for the record, and then you may begin your presentation. Sure. Thank you, Chair Kunish and members of the committee. Um, thank you for having us today. I'm Sarah Burt, and this is Caitlin Snyder. We are with Education Minnesota, and we are here to talk about the priorities that educators around the state are going to look to you to lead on. Our union of more than 85,000 educators, which includes pre-K to 12 teachers, education support professionals, school counselors, other licensed support staff, and higher education faculty have been advocating for the following funding and policy changes for years. And we hope that you will seize the opportunity you have right now to invest in these classrooms. This morning you will be hearing directly from educators, but we wanted to quickly walk you through our legislative agenda, which you all should have in your packets. To be able to fully fund schools and fully support our Minnesota students and educators during an incredible time of need, Education Minnesota is proposing the following. We need to dedicate funding tied to inflation that will go directly to solving staffing shortages, reducing class sizes, and ensuring a fair wage and benefits for all school employees. <clears throat> we need to eliminate systemic racism in our schools starting with addressing the achievement gap, getting rid of racial and cultural biases in standardized testing, offering a curriculum that reflects the diversity of our state, including ethnic studies, and recruiting and retaining BIPOC educators. We should reform the teacher pension system to make the profession more attractive to new educators, and for current teachers, provide a fair, high quality benefit that permits access to a dignified retirement even before the age of 66. Fully fund services for all children, including E12 students in special education and English language learners. Our teachers need increased prep time and due process time so they don't have to pick between their students and time with their families. We need to fund at least 16 hours of paid training for all paraprofessionals who work directly with students. Our educators need you to eliminate unnecessary policies and paperwork that suck up time during the school day. We look to you to support full service community schools, which offer a range of services for students and their families, allowing those schools to serve as a hub for their community. Our youngest learners will be better off after we create a universal child care and early learning program using mixed delivery where low-income families pay nothing, and no family pays more than 7% of their family's income on childcare costs. It is imperative we provide all students with access to professional media specialists who can teach the differences between reliable information, disinformation, and misinformation flooding social media. Minnesota is currently one of the worst states in the nation for the student to counselor ratio. In a time where we know our students are struggling with mental health, this is unacceptable. 
We need to fully staff mental and physical health teams by hiring more licensed school counselors, social workers, psychologists, nurses, and other support professionals. We also know students cannot learn when they are hungry. We support free breakfast and lunch for all students. School staff would also be free of chasing down families that have incurred debt. That's a quick overview of our priorities. Now I'll turn it over to Ms. Snyder. Ms. Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members, my name is Caitlin Snyder and I work with Ms. Bird at Education Minnesota. Members, nothing in this legislative agenda is new. Every item has already been discussed with educators, legislators, and parents. I'm sure you've heard it from educators in your district directly. Education Minnesota supports full funding of education, and that funding needs to be directed towards the classroom. Many groups of administrators will tell you to add money for education into the formula with no strings attached. Just as trickle-down economics doesn't work, we have seen that increased school funding won't trickle down to the students and educators unless directed by the legislature. We have buildings with four assistant principals and not an ESP in every single classroom. We have education support professionals whose paychecks are negative. They make less than what they have to pay in for their health insurance and so they owe the district money. We have incredible teachers who have spent years in the profession who make less than an entry level salary in the private sector. We have schools with no social workers, no psychologists, no school counselors and no school nurses. If we want our students to succeed, it starts with supporting our educators. Educators have experienced being underfunded for so many years that many have never had manageable class sizes or caseloads. They could not imagine what it would look like to have enough counselors for students or school nurses in the building every day of the week, or to not have to spend their own money to furnish their classroom. They can't even imagine being able to stay home when they're sick because there are subs available. We are asking for bold action to heal years of inaction. Despite years of underfunding, our educators have had an unwavering commitment to Minnesota students, but they are at a breaking point. Anyone who has a family member or a friend who's an educator in Minnesota can tell you, they work long hours, they don't get paid fairly for those hours, and they don't get the respect they deserve as professionals. We can change that this year, and we hope you'll join us in that effort. We are so excited to be here today with eight educators who are able to step away from their own schools to share their experiences with you. I hope that their stories will help you get a glimpse into the needs that real Minnesota educators and students share. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for allowing us to have time to share our priorities, and um, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Snyder. Question, uh, Senator Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this would be for either testifier, because I heard them both say the, the word fully fund. As we're considering the the conversations this session, can you put a dollar amount on what fully fund equals? Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Snyder, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Lucero and other members of the committee, um, some of the stories that people are going to talk to you about today I think will illustrate what that problem looks like and what the challenges facing our classroom outside of full funding experience, but Education Minnesota has said on the record that we believe full funding would cost approximately seven or eight billion dollars in additional funds. Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. So then if we, if the funding were to increase seven or eight billion, if that's what I heard correctly, and then that, everything would be fully funded, and if it were tied to inflation, I think is what I heard the, the, the policy proposal, then that would be fully funded in perpetuity going forward. Is that my understanding? Ms. Snyder. Madam Chair and Senator Lucero, it, it's a bit of a philosophical question because the proposals that we're bringing forward are to address the issues that we're seeing in students right now, but we don't know if they're going to experience you know, fewer challenges, more challenges into the future, so we're just responding to what our members are seeing in the classroom at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll probably have a number of questions uh, through the day. Um, one of the things that, uh, and either one can answer this question, one of the things that you mentioned was eliminate unnecessary policies, and we hear that all the time. Um, I've been a teacher for 20 years. I've been a special ed teacher for 15, so I know a lot of the special ed paperwork that needs to go away. But I think we need specific examples outside of, or I mean people here that, that aren't in the special ed world maybe need those special ed examples, but we need specific examples. Okay, what are the what are the mandates that need to be eliminated 
um, because I think we all on every side of the aisle agree, yeah, let's let teachers teach, but we need specific examples. Is there a question there? Qu yeah, the qu thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the question is what are some specific examples or a list of 50 examples <laughs> rather than the vague let's get rid of mandates that cost valuable time? Ms. Snyder. Madam Chair and Senator Farnsworth, um, I really appreciate that question. Uh, we have a special education task force that is a number of special education teachers and paraprofessionals from across the state that have been diving into these issues. Today, we were intending to provide more of a 10,000 foot view of what's happening in the classroom. Yourself and other educators on the committee are probably prepared to go into much more detail, um, but because this is a new uh, legislative session, we were intending to stay uh, a little bit broader today, but we'd be happy to continue that conversation, of course. Any follow-up? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm new at this and I don't know, I mean, if I'm overstepping and you're like, this is we'll let you not know. the right questions, let me know. Um, so you, you mentioned, and I've been getting a million emails about bringing back the rule of 90. Um, so specifically, I'm wondering if that were to happen, would um, the teachers, so that the rule of 90 teachers, their, their multiplier is 1.3 to 1.7. So if we were to bring that back, um, would the teachers, so myself for instance, would I lose my 1.9 multiplier and go down to the 1.3 to the 1.7? Or is the assumption that we get to keep the 1.7 to 1.9 multiplier that, um, that we gained uh, after 1989. So, Senator Farnsworth, first of all, I'll, I'll give Ms. Snyder an opportunity to respond, but we don't deal with that here in the Education um, Committee. That will go through pensions, but maybe um, Ms. Snyder has a, a response. I do, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, you're absolutely correct that when members of TRA lost the, lost the rule of 90, they gained um, essentially more credit for each year that they teach in the classroom or, or are an educator. The conversation that Education Minnesota will be bringing forward to the legislature and has drafted a bill um, and we are working on getting it introduced, it keeps the current multipliers and it works to lower the normal age of retirement. So if you're a member of TRA and you retire before age 66, you get a 7% discount on your benefit. So that means if you're going to make $1,000 a month off your pension, you'd get 7% less for the rest of your retirement age. Um, that's a little bit of a simplification, but um, for my purposes, I'm going to say that today. So every year that the normal retirement age is lowered, so if you go from 66 to 65 to 64, you are essentially removing the 7% discount for each of those years. So the proposals that we're looking forward are lowering the normal age of retirement. Um, we've, our pension task force committee recommended a normal age of retirement of 62 or 30 years of service, because um, there are some folks that start teaching or educating very early on in their careers, but keeping the higher level of uh, service credit for each year. That's what we're intending to bring forward. Senator Farris, a follow-up? Follow oh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, nope, that's, that's it for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Question, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you talked about teacher loss and recruitment, uh, teacher recruitment. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what the efforts are to recruit more teachers, and if you have the number, and if not, that's okay, but if you have the number of how many teachers we've approximately lost in the last few years that have left the business, not, yeah. <laughs> Correct. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Gustafson, there was a really great presentation in um, Chair Swazinski's Education Policy Committee yesterday that sort of talked about the difference between the number of licensed teachers we have and the number of folks actually working in the classroom. I don't have those numbers on me today, but the next presentation you will hear is sort of about the challenges that teachers have been facing um, during the COVID pandemic and sort of what's driving people out of the classroom. So hopefully that'll help Lucy update um, some of the challenges. Although of course you yourself are very familiar. Follow up? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick follow-up. Um, yes, I always joke that um, you can tell how stressful teaching is if you leave that profession to run for office. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I hear you. I'm just wondering if there's any specific strategies that um, Edmund is doing for teacher recruitment. Um, and if, and you know, if you don't have that information today, that's fine. But wondering if maybe a follow-up to in future conversations would deal with that. Ms. Snyder. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Gustafson, so recruitment is incredibly important to get more people into the profession. We've seen the number of people entering the profession go down over the last few decades. Um, but also retention is something that we're very focused on. We see people leaving the classroom because of their working condition, because of their low pay. And Dr. Killian, when he presents, will sort of talk about that. And um, there are a number of recommendations from the report that will be discussed as well. Great. Anything else? Any other questions right now? Well, thank you both for um, your overview. We really appreciate the work that you've done and the work that you will do during this session. We will now move on and listen to um, uh, reports about challenges in the classroom. Um, because there are so many of us on this committee that have those actual experiences, uh, and have experienced those personal challenges as educators ourselves. Some of this won't be surprising, and, and I don't think that it'll be surprising to most, but we'll begin with um, Dr. Killian. He is the Education Issues Specialist, Policy Research and Outreach Department of the Education Minnesota. Madam Chair, do I need to do something special to make this display? Thank you. So, Dr. Um, Killian, if you'd like to introduce yourself, and you may begin your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Kunish. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you all for allowing us to speak today on behalf of the more than 80,000 members, both licensed and non-licensed, that Education Minnesota is proud to represent. My name is Dr. Justin Killian, and I'm the co-director with my colleague, Dr. Sarah Ford, of the Educator Policy Innovation Center at Education Minnesota. The Education Policy Innovation Center released a report recently, which I'm here to talk about. Uh, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the findings of the report. And then I have two members of the member advisory team that directed the report that will be speaking after me. Uh, they're both licensed educators and they'll both be talking about their experiences in the classroom. Um, I'd like to begin by just telling you briefly, because some of you are new to the committee and some of you maybe have heard of us and some of you have not, what EPIC is. Uh, EPIC is an in-house public policy think tank that was funded by Education Minnesota. It is Minnesota's only educator-led and educator-funded and educator-directed research think tank. Uh, we created EPIC because we found that in many conversations, much like the conversation we're having today, uh, licensed educators and paraprofessionals aren't in the room. And a lot of time the conversations happen at times like 8.30 in the morning because that's when we all do business, but our members are in classrooms with kids. And so EPIC was a way for us to bind research and peer-reviewed uh, academic studies with the real lived experiences of our members and elevate those into these important policy discussions so that their voice is heard. Um, all of our reports uh, live on our website, but we did bring a copy of the most recent report today uh, for anyone that would like um, to have one. So our most recent paper uh, looked at what school was like over the last three years for our members. So since spring of 2020, when the pandemic uh, became uh, a reality and we all went into quarantine, what has public school looked like? Um, we had a 20 member advisory team advise this paper. They were uh, our members, both licensed educators, support service personnel, ESPs. Uh, we had school nurses, school counselors, school social workers. We had representation from all regions of Minnesota, from the far northwest corner to the down in the southeast corner, and we had a, uh, a wide diversity of uh, ra uh, racial and gender representation, as well as um, uh, licensed educators working with all different age groups. Um, this group of educators met multiple times, uh, and they poured mm -hmm. over a data set of 200 
about 200 narrative responses that they received from our members. They went out into the field in their various regions uh, and they conducted a qualitative analysis and they asked our members two questions primarily. What was it like for the last two and a half years and what was it like for your students? And then they followed that question up with, if you could let lawmakers and decision makers and legislators know just one thing about what the last two and a half years were like for you and your students, what would it be? Um, I'm gonna let you know that I've been doing this work for a really long time and I read through all of these narratives with our members. This is one of the hardest data sets I've ever had to analyze or read through. Talking about teachers getting divorced, thinking about suicide, not eating, not sleeping, worrying about their students. So the stories I'm going to share and the stories that the members that so follow me are going to share are not going to be very <laughs> uplifting. I'm going to let you know that right now. But I think it's very important to bring those voices into the room so we know the realities we're facing. We're not just talking about formulas, we're talking about people and we're talking about kids. So what did this team find as they did their research and they did their report? Um, the thing that they came to is that the systemic failures that we're seeing in public schools existed long before COVID-19. They're not new. But what COVID-19 did is it came and it exacerbated those problems and it also brought those problems to the attention of the public uh, and to audiences that maybe never paid attention to them to begin with. Um, so is this throughout like my presentation, I'm gonna have it? quotes from the actual narratives uh, that we received as we did this research. And this one is probably the best summation of sure. all 200. <laughs> uh, we had one member write in, simply put, things are not good and teachers are not well. So like I was saying uh, before, um, our members have been very clear that they don't want any of us to pretend like COVID-19 is the cause of any of these problems that I've put up on the screen. All of these things existed before we went into quarantine. All of these things have always been there. All of these things have been holding our students back and have been hampering our educators. But what COVID-19 functioned as is it was more of a spotlight or a flashlight that made it very real for the media and made it very real for parents and made it very real for audiences that maybe don't always pay as close attention to public education as those of us in this room. It seems a little cliche at this point to say that the last few years have been hard or difficult for our students. Even words like impossible or trauma-filled do not fully describe what learning and working in our public schools during a global pandemic was like. State lawmakers, the voting public, and concerned administrators must pause at this crucial moment and ask the questions, what made these previous two school years unlike previous years, and what have we learned about how to improve and enhance the work lives of educators and the learning environments of students? And these are the questions we have to ask, right? Like we've been given this opportunity to take a moment and reflect on how we do public school, and that's the question we're all here to answer. Uh, we're not alone in raising this alarm. Uh, some esteemed colleagues and some esteemed researchers at the Learning Policy Institute had said this is the time for the United States of America to hold a mirror to public education and say, is this the way that we should actually be doing things? Um, so I'd like to put a little bit of the narratives that you're gonna hear from my members um, into a, both a national and a state context. So nationally, here are just a, a few numbers that we cover in the paper that we should bring to your attention. Since the 80s, we've long done a national survey and asked teachers, how satisfied are you with your profession? In the year um, 2005, about 57% of teachers nationally said they were very satisfied with their profession. We did the exact same survey in the year 2022, and 12% said they were very satisfied. It's a drastic drop, and that is a sign of an unhealthy profession. Our educator attrition is at a crisis level where one out of every three of our teachers will leave the profession within the first five years, and those numbers are even more staggering and more um, shocking for our BIPOC educators. The mental health crisis among our adolescents has been far aggravated by COVID-19, and the Surgeon General and the American Pediatric Association have recently said we're not only dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're dealing with a student mental health pandemic as well. 
We also have the highest level of child poverty among any of the developed nations, and we match that with one of the lowest investments in public education. And that hurts my feelings and should hurt everyone's feelings in this room that as the richest nation on the planet, we allow children to live in poverty and we don't fund public education at the levels where we should. If we wanna put this into a Minnesota context, Minnesota's public school system is not working for our BIPOC students. Our state reports some of the largest opportunity gaps in the achievement, in academic achievement, in student discipline, in graduation rates, and other measures of life outcome than any other state in the union. To answer the question about teacher recruitment and retention that came up earlier and what Education Minnesota is doing about recruitment, we're gonna give you some policies about recruitment. But the thing that we always like to remind people is that we don't have a recruitment problem. We have a retention problem. It takes about 63,000 licensed teachers to fully staff our Minnesota public schools. If we pull every active teaching license from the Pelsby, and then we pull out people that are of retirement age or that we know have moved on to different professions, we have approximately 50,000 Minnesotans with an active teaching license working in banks, working in bars, selling real estate, doing anything but teaching. They keep their licenses active, but they've left the profession for a variety of reasons. And the reason they've left the profession is because of the damage we've done to it. We also know that Minnesota schools still lack the minimum number of school-based mental health professionals to meet national staffing recommendations. And we know that our state government continues to divest from public education um, when funding matters most. So as our members poured over the research and poured over the responses from our members, they found seven consistent themes, no matter where the educator was writing in from, whether it was Rochester or Moorhead or Minneapolis or Bloomington, these seven things showed up in all of the responses that we received from our members. The workloads are unmanageable. That one shouldn't be very surprising because there's less adults in the building. So people are doing more and more. They're taking on two times, three times the responsibility that they had pre-pandemic. Educators are really feeling a lack of voice in decision making. And this has been further exacerbated by the media fights over critical race theory and approval of lesson plans. So you have teachers that are already exhausted and are already tired and now they're being attacked in the press and people are uh, accusing them of indoctrinating children. Um, the student mental and socio-emotional health is at a crisis level as we've talked about. And the thing that was really, really, really hard to read and was really um, difficult were the amount of our members and the amount of our teachers that talked about their own mental health and their own physical health. I have stories of teachers talking about thinking about suicide once a week. I have stories about teachers talking about wanting to lay down in the fetal position in their classroom after the students have left because they're so exhausted and they feel so much lack of support. And the one thing that they said that they don't need is any more toxic positivity. They don't need someone coming and telling them, you're doing great, here's a starburst, Just put a smile on, take a Snickers bar, you got this, we can all do it. They just need people to admit things aren't great and we need some help and so do the students. So. We, at the end of the report, walk through what Linda Darling-Hammond of the Learning Policy Institute calls the Marshall Plan for Public Education. It's a seven-step program in which we, uh, the Learning Policy Institute lays out if the United States really wants to use this opportunity to fix public education. These are the seven places we can start to do it. Uh, we can start by changing recruitment. We can start by paying for teachers to go to school for giving their loans. Mentoring is key. Uh, leadership development, allowing teachers to teach and be active participants in their school and really thinking about school redesign, right? Are we still doing school the way that we need to be doing school in 2023? Or is this a time for us to think about maybe the schedule's not working? Maybe the way we phrase our, or frame our days aren't working? There's a lot of questions we can answer, and this is an opportunity to make some positive change. But at this point, I'll turn it over to our two EPIC team members, Andrea Lemon and Katie Angel, both um, licensed educators, and they're gonna speak about their specific role on the EPIC team and then their specific perspectives. 
Thank you, um, Dr. Killian. We do seem to have a question, Senator Verbatim. Thank you so much for that presentation. I just wanted to make sure I got um, two of the stats that you mentioned. You talked about um, in the national trends, only 12% of teachers reporting being satisfied in that drop. Could you share what that was again? Madam Chair. Go ahead. Senator, um, so since I think it's since 1985, um, so interesting enough, I forget which university did it before Merrimack, but Merrimack is now in charge of this poll as of this year. So I think they started in 85. The high point of teacher satisfaction was 2005 at 57%, but all through the late 80s and early 90s into the late 90s, it hovered around 40 to 50%. Um, in 2002, or 2022, 12% said they were very satisfied. And you can even go to the years right before the pandemic, 2018, 2019, and we were reporting numbers between 20 and 30% of people that are very satisfied. So when we start asking about why there's a teacher shortage, people aren't happy at work and working conditions or learning conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and, follow up question? Yeah, just one more, Madam Chair. Thank you. And then you had mentioned um, in the trends the number of Minnesotans with active licenses that are not currently in the teaching profession. That was 50,000? Approximately 50,000. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Chair. Senator Lucero, you had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And on that same slide on the statistics, uh, the, the data here cited is on a national level. Do you have numbers that are specific to Minnesota? Uh, I, I'm interested in the, the teachers reporting uh, satisfaction in their jobs in a similar time frame, again, just to Minnesota. And then uh, also the other direction, do you have any data for teacher satisfaction? Uh, because the pandemic obviously uh, affected multiple countries and it affected multiple education systems, the job satisfaction that the impact might have had in other countries that are comparable to U.S. Dr. Killian. Madam Chair. Um, we do have numbers on Minnesota, Senator Lucero. Um, the University of Minnesota, in conjunction with the University of Wisconsin at the Cary Institute, conducted a year and a half long study uh, of our members. Um, and we do know the Minnesota data. It's all reported in the report. Uh, we break it out by chart, not only how satisfied they are, but what's making them unsatisfied, uh, the, the specific problems. And so I would be happy to talk about that data in depth and drill down in that. As far as a global comparison is concerned, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. There are some very bright uh, individuals at uh, Stanford that track that kind of information, and I would be happy to pull that information for you um, so that we could compare ourselves to, say, France or Great Britain, uh, or, you know, everyone likes to compare us to Finland. We could find out how those teachers fared in the pandemic as compared to us. Thank you, Dr. Killian. Follow up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so if you do have the numbers on Minnesota, then specifically the things that I'm, I'm most important about. Is there a reason you didn't include that, or do you know what the number is off the top of your head? I'm, I'm curious, on that first bullet point, rather than national, uh, since the data does exist, do you have it off the top of your head? You could just give it to us now. Dr. Killian. I'm not going to quote the exact. Um, so the questions aren't asked exactly the same, right? So the way the national survey was asked is not exactly the same as the way the researchers at the, at the University of Minnesota asked the question. So it wouldn't be an apples to apples comparison. What we do know is that around 30 to 40% of our teachers are reporting deep dissatisfaction. Uh, and that I think the staggering number of about one in three of our teachers currently working actively think about leaving their profession, um, which they hadn't been doing pre-pandemic. Um, I don't have the entire carry um, survey numbers memorized, um, but they are right here in the chart, and I'm happy to give it to you. Um, the reason that I started with the national data is because of limited time in setting a context. Um, so, Thank you, Dr. Killian. Follow up? Anyone else? All right, so we have a couple of um, uh, folks on, uh, online that would like to uh, share their experiences. Katie Angel, are you there? Okay, 
Um, Andrea Lisco Lemon. Can you hear us out there in Zoom land? <laughs> Katie, can you hear us? It looks like we're muted. There we go, unmuted. All right, Katie, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Welcome to the Education Finance Committee, uh, the Senate Committee. Um, would you please state your name and um, where you're coming from, and then you may begin your testimony. Okay, my name is Katie Angel, and I am currently working as a preschool and ECFE teacher in Jordan Public School District in Jordan, Minnesota. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I will be focusing on how the pandemic affected special education and early childhood in Minnesota and what issues it brought to the surface. During the 2019-2020 and 2020 to 2021 school years, I was working as a special education para at Aquila Elementary School in St. Louis Park. Before schools closed in March of 2020, I had been working with about 13 special education students on a daily basis. After schools closed, I only worked with one student for one hour a day for the rest of the school year. This was just one example of how the amount of students required minutes were drastically reduced for special education students in the district. Minutes that these students are legally required to receive. In the fall of 2020, when schools reopened, St. Louis Park schools opened with a distance learning model and then transitioned to a hybrid model a few months later. Special education students and staff were allowed to be in person every day from the first day. All students, including SPED students, were given the choice to stick with distance learning for the remainder of the school year if their families preferred. To account for the amount of students choosing to learn from home, each grade level had one teacher that taught all the distance learning students. This way teachers were not teaching in person and distance learning at the same time. This did not happen for special education, however, even after it was requested. The special education teachers were responsible for all the students in their class, in person and at home. This meant the teachers had to do double the amount of planning, double the amount of teaching, and with zero extra time. The teachers struggled, the students struggled, and there wasn't enough time in the day for any of the students to receive the required amount of required minutes. One special education student who was supposed to get over 300 minutes a week was only receiving 90 minutes a week. When schools shut down again a few months later during another spike in COVID, Special education teachers and students were still required to be in person every day with no additional support. And when the vaccine came out, the first doses went to the teachers who were the oldest in age and who had been working from home, not the teachers who had been teaching in person every single day from the beginning of the school year. To me, this highlights how special education is forgotten about and not valued. How are we as educators supposed to help the students with the most needs succeed if we are not valued or supported. One of those special education teachers I mentioned earlier quit teaching altogether and moved out of state because she was so completely overwhelmed. I myself found a different job because I felt unsupported and undercompensated in my role as a special education parent. Paraprofessionals are the ones who are actually working with the students every day, the students who need extra help, yet they don't even get a half hour paid lunch break. I now teach preschool and early childhood education. One change I noticed immediately being back in a preschool room was how far behind my students in the fall of 2021 were compared to the students of the same age that I had taught before the pandemic. Not just academically speaking, but in areas like self-help skills, problem solving, and following one-step directions. My teaching team and I, like many other educators, have had to readjust our student goals to about a year behind where the Minnesota state standards say they should be. We are playing catch up and trying to get the students to progress even further because the kindergarten teachers still expect the students to come to kindergarten knowing certain skills. Preschool and early childhood teachers are overwhelmed and not supported as they should be. 
They are also not compensated the same as K-12 teachers. A lot of public school preschool teachers in Minnesota are on different contracts than the elementary, middle, and high school teachers in the same district. In Jordan, we get paid hourly. We are not on salary. This means we do not get paid for the hours we miss on early release days, we do not get paid for snow days, and we do not get paid for any holidays. Even though we are all required to have a teaching license to do assessments, hold parent-teacher conferences, and have every other responsibility that other contracted teachers have. If we are going to have successful students in Minnesota, we need to start with our youngest learners. We need to support all the teachers and paraprofessionals in our public schools. Thank you. Just one minute. All right, thank you, um, Katie, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have a question for uh, Ms. Angel? If you think of anyone, um, if you don't mind, Ms. Angel, just sticking around a little bit in case somebody something comes up. All right, next we have uh, Ms. Lemon. If you would like to share your thoughts, um, uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're coming from, and then you may begin. Let me participate today. My name is Andrea Lemon and I'm a teacher. I'm in North St. Paul Maplewood Oakdale Schools. I'm a care and treatment teacher uh, at the hospital settings for adolescents with mental health and substance use disorder. I'm a teacher and a product of the great education system we have here in Minnesota. I was born and raised in Moorhead. My parents valued education. My father was a small business owner and my mother was a teacher. I remember as a child, I admired the fact that my mother could be an educator, a teacher, someone that managed to maintain a career in her home and could also raise her children at the same time. At a young age, I knew I too wanted to be a teacher and I wanted to help others. I attended school in Moorhead Public Schools from kindergarten until I graduated high school. I was one of the first students to participate in the newly founded program in Minnesota PSEO, post-secondary education option. I then started my career in education as a paraprofessional for a student with autism, a newly founded and identified, at the time, special education eligibility area in Minnesota, in the very school district I received my own education. As I worked as a paraprofessional in Moorhead Schools, I was furthering my education at Moorhead State University with a degree in elementary education. At the time, I could have attempted to get a job in Fargo Schools, North Dakota, but at the time I chose the more appealing state of Minnesota. I wanted to stay in my home state. It was widely known that North Dakota was one of the lowest paying states when it came to the income of teachers. I was so proud to be a part of the education system in Minnesota. While I was attending my undergraduate program, I knew I was part of a very progressive, respected, and highly innovative state when it came to educating children. Upon completion of my education, by attend I decided to further my education by attending a graduate special education program. And once done, I jumped at the chance to start one of the first self-contained special education classroom for children with autism in St. Paul schools. I enjoyed working with these children and decided to further my career by helping more children with autism. I then began working for one of the larger intermediate school districts as an autism resource specialist. And I spent 17 years in that district educating children, assessing them to determine their needs and the best services to help them and training other educators in the area of autism and how to deescalate children when they were dysregulated. During this time, I was raising five of my own children in the Minnesota school system, two of them with special needs. One of my own children needed additional support due to their significant mental health needs. My child struggled significantly during this time attending day programs and intensive outpatient programs, partial hospitalization, and residential programs. I decided I really wanted to further help children, and so I took my great Minnesota education and experience and accepted a position with ISC 622 North St. Paul Maplewood Oakdale Schools, teaching at a residential treatment program for adolescents with dual diagnosis, mental health and substance use disorder. I loved teaching in this program. I was responsible for teaching math, language arts, and social studies to all 14 students in the program, grades six through 12 both general education and special education. At this time, I was the only teacher. It was challenging, but I felt it was really making a difference. And then the COVID pandemic happened. For safety reasons, schools understandably closed. 
children across our state stayed home and education was then presented by means of virtual presentation. Parents were expected to step up and support and monitor their children while participating in the online education. This was a struggle for many of the students in Minnesota, but especially for those students in hospital and residential settings. They did not have parents or guardians or their loved ones around to support and monitor them while online. The significant needs they had did not go away during this time. In fact, for many of these needs intensified due to subsequent isolation. We saw more and more students needing help and the waiting lists grew longer and longer. During this time, we found it more challenging to invite staff to work in my program to support me when helping the students in the classroom or even in the residence that they lived in. This required me to continue to attend school face to face with the students, putting myself at risk my own family at risk and the students in the program at risk simply for me coming and going into the program. I was attending a program with adolescents struggling with mental health issues and substance use that didn't fully understand the need to wear masks. And then I would go home to my own family, potentially exposing them, someone significantly compromised immune system. I was emotionally torn. This was my job and this was my family. Everyone needed me. These children were stopped from having visits with their own families if they wanted to continue to be in the residential programs. This was a very difficult situation for all involved. Throughout this challenging time, I found it very difficult to even take time to care for myself or take time off as there was no one to fill my position as a sub. I share this all with you to illustrate the dedication I and all the teachers have for our students but we are failing to recognize the ongoing and increased need for support our children have during this difficult time of transition. The majority of our students in Minnesota can attend schools, but there's a group of students that need more support than our own schools can offer. They need more support in terms of counseling, psychiatry, nursing services, and along with that, they are entitled to an education. But we do not have enough of these programs to support these students. Right now, at just my program alone, we have over a three-week waiting list to help these children. Teachers, like myself, want to meet the needs of all our students. And teachers all across the state are going to be looking to the legislature to fully fund the recruitment and retention programs necessary to deliver the highest quality education to all students in Minnesota. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Liska Lemon. Um, I really appreciate the work that you've done over this time of uh, really great challenges. And it's just... Um, everything has been so as exacerbated in the fact that um, that you have taken such such hard work and taken it to heart. We we really do ap appreciate the work that you do. Is there anyone that has a question for Ms. Lisko Lemon? Well, I thank both of you for zooming in this morning and um, helping us work some of the kinks out of our Zoom testimony. But um, we do appreciate hearing your voice. Um, it's really important we hear the voices of the, the teachers and our students through those voices. So thank you very much, and we wish you all the best for the rest of your school year. If you have to get off, go ahead. If anybody has a question, we might call you up later. But if you need to get on with your day, thank you so much. So next we're going to hear a little bit about special education, due process, and the cross-subsidy. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Dr. Chair Kunish, I just wanted to say I flagged all the data that Senator Lucero was asking about in this report for him. So I was just going to leave this here for him to pick up because he was curious about the Minnesota-specific data. Thank you, Dr. Killian. And perhaps you would um, maybe be able to share that electronically with my assistant, and then we can put that information out to um, the entire Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. All right. Uh, so next we have uh, Jasmine Myers. I believe you're coming in from Zoom as well. Jasmine, would you introduce yourself? Um, tell us where what you your uh, role is, and then you may begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jasmine Myers. I am a special education resource teacher with nine plus years of experience as a K-12 tier three emotional behavior disorder teacher. I was a former applied behavioral analysis therapy therapist with a master's of arts in teaching and a bachelor's of arts from Hamlin University. Can I begin? Yes, please do. Thank you. 
Um, I am testifying here today to provide information about the challenges facing our students and educators in special education programs and how the committee can address these challenges. As a special education teacher, I am committed to preparing every student with or without a disability for the opportunity to succeed. I devote five out of six hours each school day to provide direct sorry, services um, to federal setting one, two, and three students with various disabilities. That means the students spend some or most of their time in a general education classroom. I plan, I execute individualized education programs, those are IEPs, in small groups or co-teaching, depending on the student's service needs. This is a complex process. Of course, it's individualizing education. Um, it's very fluid, but it can be clotted like the arteries of a heart. To alleviate this pressure, my district allows for 50 minutes per day for preparation and an additional 18 hours per year for due process time. The preparation time is the same for a general and special education teacher, but the additional due process hours, those are unique. Um, not all districts practice the same standards of due process practices um, and compensation and benefits. The expectation from the Individuals with Disabilities Act is clear in its obligation to due process that ensures students with disabilities are provided with a free and appropriate public education that is tailored to their individual needs. This legislation promotes appropriate education, which of course takes time. Time to prep, time to meet with parents, time to do observations, time to consult, time to draft and finalize those individualized plans. Every single educational professional spends countless hours um, during the school day, before school, after school, on the weekends, and even over holidays to complete due process paperwork because legislation requires that paperwork to be completed within a time frame. Due process time and indirect time are documented without accountability. Special education teachers like myself are left overwhelmed with the dual responsibility as a service provider and a case manager during what we all know to be a national teacher shortage. Um, what type of future do we see for our students if this cycle continues? In my future, I am reaching for uh, education legislation that thrives on diplomacy, fair treatment, and resources for all educational staff. As, as you start to craft a budget, I urge you to consider the needs of students and the educators in special education. Our students deserve to have their needs met in the least restrictive environment. And our special education teachers deserve time in their regular scheduled day to meet those needs. Teachers should have, should not, I'm sorry, should not have to choose between their students and their own families. We can do better. And I urge you to fully fund special education and due process requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Um, I'm inspired by the work that you do. Members, is there a question? Uh, Senator Farnsworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm gonna have a number of questions, so I'll apologize in advance. Um, I'll lump the first two questions together. Um, just curious how many students you have on your caseload, and if you could give us an example or even an exhaustive list, if you have it, of paperwork that you would love to get rid of um, in within the special ed world. Ms. Myers. Uh, thank you for that question. So I understand it to be how many students do I have on my caseload. As of right now, I have 18 students on my caseload and two are on the process or on MTSS is which, what we call the process of getting uh, evaluating for additional service. So it's a fluid um, process that continues to expand and decrease through time. But as of right now, I have 18. The most I've had on my caseload was 23. Um, accord, when it comes to the question about how much paperwork um, for every student, we have to do progress reporting three times a year. Um, and that is due process paperwork. We have to do an annual IEP every year. That's paperwork. We have to do um, 
If there is a restrictive procedure, we have to document that. There are meetings that go along with that with additional documentation. Almost every step of the way, there's some sort of documentation that has to be filed. So it, depending on the student's level of service, it can be a, a large amount of paperwork or a small amount, but there's multiple documents for every student who they are all knocking at my door. <laughs> Ms. Myers, can you continue or uh, do you need to get back to your classroom? Um, I can continue for a few minutes. They're eating breakfast, but they like to say good morning. Okay, thank you. <laughs> a follow up, Mr. F or Senator Farnsworth? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, if you would, um, so you mentioned the paperwork that you do. Again, we're looking for examples of specific paperwork you'd like to get rid of that you, you know, at least in your opinion, are, you know, maybe pointless. Um, you know, for example, I would suggest getting rid of objectives uh, in, an, mm -hmm. in an IEP. Um, you also mentioned the two students that are in the process of testing, um, which leads to one of, my, one of my other questions. What type of intervention system do you have um, pre-special ed in your district? And again, asking a lot of opinion stuff, do you find the, it, that it's successful in, in what it's supposed to do? Ms. Myers. Thank you for those questions. So what paperwork would I get rid of in my own opinion? Um, I would, would definitely get rid of some of the sections within the IEP that is redundant. There are multiple sections that ask for present levels um, and it's in every single section. So it repeats itself multiple times. Um, there are sections in the IEP for um, support services and services. It's just like a double up. So those sections I would get rid of, but I'd also um, strongly urge anyone to communicate with parents and other members of the IEP team just to clarify which pieces are the most valid for all the individuals involved in the IEP meeting process, because I am just one of many team members. Families are also a part of the process and the student, depending on their age as well. Um, to answer the question about the process in my school district currently, to become a student with uh, services. Well, we have a system called MTSS, uh, which is an intervention system. And we have staff called behavior intervention specialists who um, design individualized intervention plans for behaviors and academic behaviors. Um, and we have an academic behavior intervention team as well that provides services. So they have to have at least uh, six weeks of data to show that there is no success with that intervention before the student can begin um, the discussion on whether or not a special education evaluation is appropriate. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Any follow-up, Senator? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. If you will indulge me for one more question. Uh, and so I have an EBD license, I'm an EBD teacher, and so part of the reason for my questions is I think there's a lot of people that don't necessarily understand what special ed teachers go through. So I guess my last question is sort of a, an, a broad one, sort of explaining, you know, describing your day. We know you have a ton of paperwork. You have um, 18, you've had as high as 23 kids on your caseload, which is at least five above uh, best practice. Um, are you doing direct instruction in addition to the behavior stuff? Like do you pull, you know, a kid out for math or for, for, um, for English? Because I think, that sort of gets to the heart of what a special ed teacher does. You're not just doing social studies, you know, one lesson, you know, to a group, and then the next group you do another lesson. You might be doing individual lessons for individual kids. So this will be my last question. Um, but if you could just describe your day so that folks here get an idea of what, what a special ed teacher goes through. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you for that question. Um, and I'm happy to hear that you're also an EBD teacher. <laughs> Okay, so my day is um, five hours of 10 small groups um, that range from different core curriculum. So I have a reading instruction, I, I teach uh, math instruction, I teach social skills instruction, and it's all tailored to the individual students within that group's specific needs. Um, same with the other teachers within my building. So that means we get um, curriculum that we have to modify to meet the students' individual needs, uh, which takes a lot of prep and planning uh, because we can't just take the curriculum at face value. So everything has to be modified or adjusted 
um, based on the information we receive from an evaluation um, and the information we gather during IEP meetings. So it's the, the day is very fluid with a lot of small groups. Um, as of right now, I am not co-teaching, so I pull small groups of between two to six students in a small room for direct instruction, and then they return to class, and then I begin another group right after. So it's just back-to-back -back groups. The only breaks I have are for lunch and for my prep, and a lot of those times involve students because there may be a behavioral concern that might happen during my lunch or during my prep time. So I also voluntarily <laughs> voluntold, um, put that time out there to support my students when they need it. Thank you, Ms. Meyer. Any other questions? Oh, uh, Senator Wicklin, or excuse me, Wesleyan. All the W's look alike. <clears throat> um, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for your testimony today. Um, it, it seems to me, if I'm understanding correctly, and perhaps you can enlighten me on this, is part of the problem may be redundancy in paperwork, but it seems that, that what is onerous is your caseload and that what we really need are more special education teachers to spread the work out um, so that the necessary paperwork can be completed in an appropriate way. Um, what is your special ed staffing um, at your location and are you short of staff right now? That is a very good question. So currently we have four teachers on contract and one teacher that is not on contract. Um, we were short that one teacher for a very long time and that's why we had to go with a teacher who was like outsourced through an agency. Um, another issue is with paraprofessionals because with IEPs some students have paraprofessional support um, and that is always a, a empty position within our school um, and if any of us need to take a day off or have to do a uh, due process during the school day there really isn't any special education um, substitutes so most of the time what we get is substitutes for general education teachers who don't have the training in special education, which then interrupts services, um, obviously because they're not getting service from a service provider, but just a, another licensed teacher. Um, within our district, there I think are a few open positions in special ed. Um, and if we were to go exactly by what each individual student's IEP is asking for, every school in every district would be short staffed because there's so much need documented that is not being expressed as far as staffing. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Follow up at all? No, thank I have just one quick question. Um, um, how does it work for standardized testing when the time comes for um, MCAs or any of the other uh, developmental testings? How does that affect your job and your classroom of students? That's a really good question. Um, I have been a high school teacher um, and an elementary school teacher, so standardized testing is very important to me. Um, it reflects what the school is doing and the progress of the student. So what, what it looks like for us is uh, we do testing accommodations, so we're all um, able to be uh, what's the word for it? We're all able to, to proctor any of those exams, but we also are responsible for providing those testing accommodation spaces and extended time. So what that looks like for me in real time is if today was an MCA testing day, I would have no other groups. The students would have the extended time within a small group setting to continue and to complete their standardized test in an environment where they're most comfortable. Um, but there are sometimes cases where students need more support. For example, if they have um, vision loss uh, and they need the material to be read to them, that also requires an individual adult to be in the space who also is a proctor to the exam and can give those accommodations in the space. So it's something we have to prep for as well. Um, that takes additional time and we always have to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Quest um, uh, Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to Ms. Myers and also yeah. Senator Farnsworth. Special education is a very tough job. Um, I, I'm 
just a regular teacher, just a history teacher. So it's tough, but it's not special education tough. And I understand the voluntold um, role that often happens. Um, I also know that special education is some of the highest burnout, right? It is tough to find special education teachers, partly because of what you're talking about with that uh, due process funding. And I guess um, you're also one of the first lines of mental health um, mm -hmm. because you have such an important relationship with your students. Um, I'm wondering what due process funding looks like. You mentioned that earlier, and I was just wondering if you could say more about what what funding for for due process would look like, or just special education in general that would immediately help you in the classroom. Um, I've worked in two separate districts, um, and the due process funding was extremely different in both. Um, within the St. Paul Public School District, it was an unlimited amount of time that you could request from your site lead to take time to complete due process during the school day, um, which meant you would kind of sit in a staff lounge and do your due process there and have a sub in your stay. Um, in this district, they offer 18 hours outside of the workday, and you have to be logged on to the system that uh, our due process documentation resides. For us, it's um, SPED forms. So you have to be logged into that piece um, for that duration of the time to be able to be compensated and to do a timesheet. Um, if you go over the 18 hours, you no longer get any more funds for it. Um, and what that means for us and like on the real end of things is that people kind of store that time because they're going to take the time to do the due process paperwork because it has to be done, right? It's, it's legislation. We have to complete that information or we're at risk of losing our teaching license. So if there was a fully funded um, system for special education, what I imagine that to look like is any time that I need to spend on due process, I could bill for it so that the state can have a real reflection of how much time it takes to complete those pieces of information. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ms. Myers. Uh, just to follow up on that, is that 18 hours for the entire school year? Is that 18 the hours? the entire school year. The entire school year, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Well, we are going to um, move along. Yes, Madam the, Chair. Oh, excuse I'm, me, Senator Swadzinski. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, I had the exact same question. So you get one hour a year, because you have 18 kids on your class, mm -hmm. on your caseload, so that's one hour yeah. a year. Correct? If you think of it as one hour per kid. Yeah, um, that's what I meant. That's a way to look at it. Sometimes that's how I look at it. But there are days where it could take me four hours to complete an IEP because it's such a complex um, document that requires a lot more teamwork and communication. So one hour in theory, but it, in reality, it's not a one hour um, objective or task. Well, we, we will do our best to reduce that amount of paperwork that you have in the, in the coming session. And those kids are going to be banging on the door, I think, pretty soon as well. <laughs> Thank you they so are. much, Ms. Meyer. We really appreciate you sharing your um, experience and um, appreciate your dedication, obviously, elementary, high school, um, special ed students. Appreciate your dedication to our students. Thank you. Thank All you. right, we will move along now to uh, hear a little bit about paraprofessional training and hourly unemployment. Um, I'm looking for Katina Neal Taylor. Yes, hello. Hi, Hi. I'm here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, would you just say, state your name and uh, where you're coming from for the record, and then you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Hello, all. Thank you for giving me this time to speak. My name is Katina Taylor. I am an educator, wife, mother, caregiver, and community member. I've been an educational support professional with Minneapolis Public Schools for 24 years and counting. I am currently serving as the ESP president of MFT 59. Educational support professionals are the glue that keeps schools together. We are the first ones to greet students in the morning and often the last adults they see before going home. In between, we build strong relationships with students and they trust us. 
We work in the classrooms assisting teachers. We work in with small groups of students providing individualized support. We are on the playground, regardless of the weather. We are in the lunch rooms, the office, the media center, in the hallways, and out at bus duty. Teachers can't do their work without support staff. Many ESPs currently make less than a living wage and lack access to affordable health care and insurance. The legislature has the resources to right this wrong for these essential workers. The low pay and uncertainty of summer employment are forcing many to leave the profession for more secure jobs. School staffing shortages are at an all-time high and we need to move quickly to ensure we can recruit and retain quality school staff for our kids. The legislature has the resources to help stop the exodus of talent in the field and has the ability to ensure access to unemployment insurance for all ESPs. These critical educators that are disproportionately women and people of color. Though the importance of our work is apparent, thousands of ESPs don't have enough left in their paychecks after paying for health care, paying for a week's worth of groceries, much less child care. The legislature has the resources to help change this and could require at least a $25 minimum wage for all educational support professionals. To further set ESP workers up for success, the legislature should fund at least 16 hours of paid training for all workers. Better training will ensure we can keep more of these workers in this essential role in our classrooms. Without a doubt, we are the glue that holds schools together while helping students see themselves at school. Thank you all for listening and I'm wishing you all a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. We really appreciate the words that you're telling us. I myself have been a teacher for 25 years. Um, there's a number of us here uh, on the committee that worked, have worked in schools, and we recognize when you say that you are the glue that holds the school together, it is absolutely true. Members, do you have any questions? Oh, we have one question, Senator uh, Weslin. Madam Chair and um, uh, Ms. Taylor, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, do you have an idea of how many uh, ESP positions are unfilled currently in your district? Yes, I say about 350 positions are open right now. My goodness. Thank you. And uh, Senator Farnsworth, question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Ms. Taylor, I see in our agenda that you are the ESP chapter president. Is that correct? Um, yes, sir. And so you, I assume then you would be responsible for negotiating contracts with the, okay, so, so I guess my question is you mentioned the $25 minimum wage. What has been the response um, in negotiations with the school district with, with a request like that? Ms. Taylor. Thank you so much for that question. I am the newly elected ESP president, uh, and I will be working with our district to, you know, get up to a, a $25 minimum wage. Uh, right now, negotiations have been tough, you know, as you already know what we've been through last spring. Um, hopefully this legislature can uh, fully fund public schools and we won't have to hear the district says there's no money. Uh, that's been a big deal. Uh, if you guys could fully fund schools, I'm sure that we won't hear the problems of there's no money to, um, get us at $25 an hour, starting. Thank you, follow up? Well, we thank you again. Uh, appreciate the work that you do, not just for our students, but also for your union sisters and brothers, and uh, wish you a, a, a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we will now listen and learn a little bit about our full service community schools, the programming and the funding. Um, is Maureen uh, Morrow here? I think she will be zooming I in. Am. 
I'm sorry, pardon? I'm right here. There she is. If you would like to state your name for the record, uh, let us know where you are, and then you may begin your testimony. Madam Chair, my name is Maureen Morrow, a high school Spanish teacher in Deer River, Minnesota. After visiting both out-of-state and in-state facilities that called themselves full-service community schools, a small team of teachers um, here in Deer River and administration were ready to provide students with what the community told us they needed. We wanted to make access to basic needs easier for our kids and their families. For most people, it sounds simple to figure out how to get a job, how to get food to your family, how to make sure your child's teeth are taken care of, or get their eyes examined to see if they have glasses. If you are a person without access to private or public transportation, that is just one of the many obstacles that prevent a parent or guardian from being able to support a family and or children with basic needs. How do we as educators um, expect um, equal or have equal expectations of our classrooms of kids when we know that they all aren't starting from the same starting point? Um, our families might not know how to make an appointment to go to the doctor, dentist, eye doctor, anything like that. Um, you might chuckle at the lack of common knowledge, but it's not common knowledge to everyone. Just as I have never been taught how to change the oil in my own car, which is something that is like a mechanic or maybe even just any average Joe, um, but it's something that I've, I've never been taught. Um, why would I assume that our families and their adults and kids have any idea how to do things that I assume are common knowledge? The Deer River Full Service Community School not only provides services within the school area, like bringing doctors or eye doctors in, dentists in for our kids, but we also help with their adults. We help their adults learn how to access and fill out paperwork for things like insurance, mental health supports, and more. And kids are always hungry. Our students know that they can stop by the full service community school rooms and grab a snack to help them get through the afternoon if lunch just didn't fill them up. Kids don't have to worry about how they're going to make their doctor's appointments or court appointments, which have huger input, I mean, fallout if they're not followed through with. Um, our full service community school staff make sure that our kids are able to make commitments and then follow through to fulfill them. Our students worry less about getting their needs met and more at more of a basic level, and our students don't have to concern themselves with more adult responsibilities, like making sure there's transportation for an appointment. Um, I know that my students can be kids. I know that they're able to, to let go of some of the unnecessary responsibilities that are put upon them because of lack of life experiences. I know my students can focus on their studies and their futures because of the supports that our schools have built. Um, students across the state of Minnesota deserve to learn in this kind of environment. And I want to thank uh, Chair Kunish for introducing Senate Bill 20 that would invest $90 million in our full service community school model. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, so far away this morning. Appreciate the work that you do. You're a high school Spanish teacher, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And how long has your school been a, a, a community, a full service community school? So six years, we started the process six years ago. And did you begin with them when it became a full service school? Yes, I did. I was part of actually kind of this top of the hill snowball and then we kind of pushed it down by visiting different uh, facilities across the country really and seeing what we like best, and then we did a, like an, uh, not an interest survey, but like a needs assessment for our, our whole community, and then went with that. So based on your experience as an educator and a community member, um, and then also being able to connect with parents, would you say that this full service community school serves your community very well? Would you ever go back to, you know, that, the the non-community school model? Never. I mean, our kid, our, there is such a high need. There are, I, this is the thing is like, it's, 
it's amazing to me, it's that common knowledge factor that you think that everybody knows how to do everything you know how to do. And if those ex life experiences have never been like available to somebody, they don't know how to do what I know how to do. Mm -hmm. So they don't know how to call the doctor. They don't know how to go to the food shelf. They don't have a car to go to the food shelf. I mean, it's easy to say, go get a job or go shopping. But if you don't have a way to get to your job or if you don't have the right clothes to you would be presentable at a job interview, like those kind of things are what our full service community schools does for our people in not just the adults in our kids' lives, but like our adult kid, our adult students too. We help them get jobs and we do internships with them. And I mean, we just help them experience more than they could if they were on their own. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have uh, Ms. Haran there with you, your yes, full service does. coordinator? Yep. Would you yes. like to um, state your name and tell us where you are and then maybe share a little bit about what you would like to tell us today? Go ahead. Sorry, good morning, Madam Kunish and community members. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you about full service community schools. My name is Deanna Roan. I'm from Deer River. We're about 200 miles north of the Twin Cities. I am the full service community school coordinator for King Elementary School. I've been in my position for four years. We are a small rural district who began implementing the full service community school strategy about six years ago. Um, over the past several years, um, the barriers that impact our students have been magnified due to COVID and all of the things that have been going on in our world. Our students and families face barriers each day. These barriers include food insecurity, inadequate housing, lack of access to medical, um, dental vision, mental health services, to name a few. The goal of a full service community school is to reduce and remove those barriers so that students will be ready to learn. In Deer River, we are beginning to see the results of our supports. Our students and families know that they can reach out for help. In the past month, we have taken 20 students to the eye doctor. We have a partnership with an eye doctor in a neighboring community and he blocks off a morning once a month so that we can bring our students over to him. They go through the process. If they need glasses, we have a grant that we are able to purchase those glasses with. So anecdotally, we have 20 students in our elementary school who are now wearing glasses that were not wearing glasses at the beginning of the year. Mm. If it wasn't for the full service school, we would not have the ability to do this for our families. Currently, students are, currently schools are struggling to meet the needs of their students due to so many different factors, lack of funding being one of them. The full service model puts social medical before and after school academic services and enrichment activities where they are most accessible at the school. The services that we provide are based on the needs of our students and families. My job is to match the needs of our students with the resources and partnerships that I can find. One of the um, positives of full service community schools is that there is some research that shows that there's a return on investment of about $7 for each dollar invested. So in our school right now, we have a lot of things that are brought in that our school doesn't pay for. We have mental health supports in our school. We have dental that come in to service our students. As I said, we take students out to go to the eye doctor. None of this is funded by the general fund of the school district. This is a strategy that can be Im implemented in a school with a small investment. If you do a needs assessment and you hire a site coordinator, you can begin your full service community, community school. Many schools have several of the components of a full service community school. What they lack is the coordination of services. I believe that the community school coordinator is kind of the linchpin that holds this whole thing together. 
We are asking for a small investment in the future of our children by supporting Senate File 20. Thank you, Chair Kunish, for being the chief author on Senate File 20, the bill that would put $20 million into this critical grant program. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your dedication to this, this program and meeting the needs of your community in really, really unique ways. I mean, I literally got goosebumps when you said kids now, 20 kids now have glasses. I wear glasses myself and I remember what that was like when you can't see the board and you can't hit the ball and all of those things. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing. Any questions here? Senator Kroon? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Forgive my ignorance on this program. I, I don't know a lot about these uh, these schools. Um, is there any effort to teach these parents how to do these skills, such as make doctor's appointments, or is the goal to just handle these services in perpetuity? No, it's very interesting that you asked that question because we just had the I just had this conversation with my superintendent yesterday. Um, one of our goals, we have a federal um, full service grant and one of the goals of that grant is sustainability. And so think of the analogy of teaching someone to fish. And so currently we are providing fish while we are teaching them how to fish so that we are supporting their students in in the moment and in the crisis or whatever it is they need, but we are also supporting the families in helping them navigate the system and learn how to work with the system. So it's it's twofold. It's supporting students now, but it's also sustainability for the future so that we continue to support these families and that we build some capacity as well. Thank you. And follow up? Uh, yes, one follow up, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, you. You mentioned an example about taking 20 students to the eye doctor. I'm just wondering if you could explain that a little more. Who who are these kids? Is it for all kids or just certain kids? Uh, um, um, so in my elementary building, we have about um, 400 students. So in the fall, our school nurse screens. They do hearing and vision on all of our students. After that, our full service team meets with the nurse. We create a list of students that failed their vision screening. We then reach out to the parents with a referral. If they are able to do the referral on their own, then that, that's the process that happens. They, go, they take their child to the eye doctor, their child comes back and they have glasses. If it's a family that lacks transportation, medical insurance, can't get their child to the doctor during the school day, then the next step is to have them fill out the paperwork. We have an eye doctor in um, a neighboring community that schedules. We fill out the paperwork. We provide the transportation to the eye doctor. If there's insurance, the insurance pays. If not, we have a grant that pays for un and underinsured. Then if there's glasses that are needed, the same process happens. If there's insurance, the insurance will pay for it. If not, then we have some funders in place that will pay for it. So basically, we start out with the expectation that your child needs to go and have an eye exam, sending home all the referral paperwork, and then we go from there looking for students and families that need support to continue the process to actually get the eyeglasses. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, one more question, uh, Senator Farnsworth. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, and you may not be able to answer this because the COVID shutdown sort of threw everything into disarray, but I'm wondering, do you have data for, for the students that, are, that have been actively involved in this program, do you have data uh, on improved uh, academic performance or improved um, behavioral outcomes, uh, again, for, for the students that have been directly impacted by this program? Yes, we do. Um, Deer River schools are very data driven. We have data meetings, we gather data, we look at it and in our interventions are based on that. And so yes, we do. We can go through and look over the past several years, looking at families that we have supported, that we have helped in some manner, whether it's eyeglasses or mental health referrals. And we are seeing increases in our academic 
um, data as well as our um, attendance data, which um, I'm sure you're aware during COVID attendance kind of got a little messy with, and so getting our kids back on track. So we are beginning to see um, data that shows that our students are being more successful in school with the supports. Thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you're doing for your community as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next we will hear from uh, Sarah McKeever uh, around early childhood. If you would like to state your name and um, you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning to all of you and thank you for the hard work that you all do on behalf of the people of the state of Minnesota. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about early childhood. I am a parent educator in early childhood family education in St. Cloud. And um, some of you might fondly know that program as ECFE if you happen to attend with your long, young children like I did. Um, it, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So <clears throat> I am excited to talk to you a little bit about Minnesota's nearly 50 year old early childhood family education program, which is unique in the United States if you weren't aware. Um, I personally graduated from the College of St. Benedict in 1997 and I taught kindergarten for seven years. At that point it became clear to me that children's groundwork for their educational success was already laid. And current brain research tells us that those first five years are instrumental in a child's development. Um, so uh, when I took my own two children to ECFE classes, uh, we have parent-child classes, and there's a parent educator who, you know, facilitates parent discussion and helps you get to deal with any struggles that you're dealing with, um, and you meet other parents who are going through similar struggles. Um, while your children are playing in a high-quality, um, learning-rich environment with a highly qualified early childhood teacher. Um, this is just a really unique and wonderful experience for everyone. Um, so it inspired me to go to the St. Cloud State University Parent Education Program. It's a fifth year licensure um, program and all of our parent educators in the state of Minnesota are highly qualified licensed teachers. Um, our early childhood teachers in ECFE hold a four-year degree in early childhood development and they de demonstrate a deep understanding of young children um, and what they need to reach their potential. As a field, we've learned an incredible amount about brain development in recent years. I know you've been hearing about or hearing from other experts recently about the importance of the early years and the return on investment when we put qualified professionals and our tax dollars to work for our youngest citizens. When we make smart investments in the early years, we see lower costs of special education in K-12 and state spending on social programs. In fact, studies have found that every dollar spent in early childhood uh, gives a return of seven to $17 in education, health, social, and economic outcomes. And the added bonus is it's way more fun to buy toys for preschoolers than it is to buy toys for prisons. Um, I, would norm I would personally prefer to work with parents in ECFE classes and in home visits than in area learning centers, domestic violence centers, or jails, which are all places that our district parent educators go. So we teach parents how to play. Research tells us that children learn best through play and having adults engaging with them in child-led play. We play alongside parents while they learn strategies that they can carry into their homes. We build relationships with them and model relationship building so that young children have healthy attachments with their caregivers. ECFE teachers are highly trained in what we do. And yet, myself and my colleagues around the state are not equal to their K-12 counterparts according to the law, despite being equally qualified. I've personally had to say goodbye to many excellent teaching colleagues who move on for the sole reason of needing to provide for their families. A year ago, I had to make this move myself. 
Smaller districts have fewer opportunities for full-time work, equal pay and benefits, and long-term security. And it's a real struggle across greater Minnesota. Some of them can't even staff their ECFE programs right now and don't have programs running. So I would love to attract more diversity to our field so that early childhood professionals who are representative of our children and their parents, um, th rather than pr um, just the predominantly white middle class females who are second income earners in their households of two parent families, which is what we typically see um, in our ECFE staffs right now. So I am looking to you today to take the next step in elevating early childhood as a career path in the state of Minnesota. The issue of teacher equity in our public school system is one of the many issues that we've been hearing about today that needs to be solved so that we can train up and retain qualified educators in the early childhood field. So thank you for your time and attention and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Palmer. I think we will move on to uh, Ms. Um, Hajdukovic. 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 Yes. Uh, and then we'll have questions when these our three speakers here are done. Okay, and you are a media specialist. Oh, near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, why don't you state your name, where you are working from, and then you may begin. Um, my name is Marie Hajdukovic. I am a licensed school library media specialist in South St. Paul Public Schools, where I am the district media specialist, so I'm in charge of all of our libraries in the district. Um, I'm here today to bring awareness to how library media specialists, librarians can increase student and teacher access to materials, instructional tools, digital literacy standards, as well as directly improve student academic achievement. Um, the Library Media Center is the only classroom in a school that is open all day to any student or any staff member at any time. Um, and yet, when budget cuts happen, we're the first to go. Um, while the majority of Minnesota students attend schools that claim to have a school library or media center, those media centers are overwhelmingly staffed with staff who are not trained in this important work. This is no different than leaving a kindergarten class, middle school math class, or an AP US history classroom without a licensed professional. Additionally, these workers may only check out and shelve books and perform book repairs. A licensed professional has to be present to manage collections, curate materials that supplement curriculum, as well as ensure book selection policies and book challenge procedures are in place. An LMS must be present to collaborate with other teachers to teach national library and information literacy standards, which ensure digital literacy and citizenship skills are being taught, something that is required by the FCC in order for schools to receive E-rate funding for internet services. It is also impossible to address fully the academic achievement gap without addressing the decimation of school library media specialists. It is impossible to create citizens capable of conducting credible research, identifying propaganda, and knowing the difference between myths and disinformation without library media specialists. Research and data from 34 statewide studies shows that students with access to a well-staffed, well-funded school library have smaller academic gaps in test scores. This research also shows that library media specialists are the key when it comes to critical thinking, analysis of information, and becoming lifelong readers. It is clear that students not only need libraries, but library media specialists. The American Association of School Libraries recommends a ratio of 1.0 FTE library media specialists for every 500 students, or at least a minimum of 1.0 in every school. Yet in Minnesota, the current ratio is over 1,500 students per employed school library media specialist, and that equates to an average of 0.27 FTE. All of our Minnesota children deserve a complete education, which requires access to a licensed library media specialist. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your work. Uh, next, is it, is it Mary Palmer? Yes, would you please state your name and your position and then you may begin your testimony. Thank you, good morning. Um, my name is Mary Palmer and I'm a middle school English language development teacher in the multilingual department at Shakopee Public Schools. You might be more familiar with my previous titles as ELL or ESL teacher. Shakopee is a suburban school district in the southwest of the Twin Cities with a continually growing population of English language learners 
from a wide range of locations and educational backgrounds. Currently, about 30% of our student population speak another language at home. And of those, 20% are entering school with little or no English skills. These are the students who are coming from refugee camps and war zones, or have walked thousands of miles toward a more safe and free life. They are the students who may have never had the opportunity for formal education and are now learning the alphabet and algebra at the same time. My mixed grades six, seven, and eighth grade level one classroom started with six of these kinds of students at the beginning of the year and rose to 13. We often see another influx of students at the semester change. These are students from all over Latin America, East Africa, as well as a growing number of students from Ukraine and Russia. Every school day, I assist 45 EL students who are on my caseload, as well as support 50 to 60 of my building colleagues in ways that can help these unique learners gain skills that they need to become the proficient and productive workers that will serve Minnesota in the future. If fully funding the cross subsidy was solely to make my job easier, I would have not been moved to come and speak here today. However, this funding is critical to the needs and success of our students. Being fully funded in ML would mean that we would be able to hire more ELD teachers and support staff to assist ML students on a daily basis. Being fully funded would mean our newest multilingual students would have more support as they start their English acquisition, while at the same time learning how to function in a Western school system. Students that move in from another Minnesota or US school find it easier to integrate as they have experience in a similar classroom and know the basic cultural expectations that are required of them. The number of students with interrupted formal education in our state is growing. The impact of school closures worldwide during the COVID-19 pandemic means that we are seeing students that are coming in with larger gaps in education and lower reading and math skills not to mention the social emotional needs that must be addressed. Being fully funded would mean that families of newcomer students would have more resources and communication with school employees to help them navigate the transition to an education system or simply a new type of school system. Being fully funded would mean that our higher level ML students would receive more focused attention during the school day to help them move past the English academic plateau that they find themselves on and become fully exited from the ML program. It would mean that my colleagues would have a larger pool of resources available to them to dif differentiate and plan lessons to help unique learners succeed. My school district currently has a $1.5 million ML cross subsidy de deficit as do many school districts across the state. Being fully funded would not only mean more services for ML students, but it would also relieve the pressure on schools general fund, general fund budgets and allow for additional programming that would benefit not only our ML students, but all students in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming in. And members, we're going to be hearing more about each one of these areas. So um, if you would, wouldn't mind saving your questions, we do have a couple more presenters um, that are going to be here. But we thank you um, very much for coming in here today and sharing all the, the good work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. All right, our last presenters will, um, uh, if you would like to join us up here, Kelly Gibbons and Beverly Tinney, they uh, represent and present from SEIU. If you would please state your name and you may begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I have to pull up my testimony here and wasn't expecting to get them up yet. Uh, just two seconds. I also wanted to say today that um, I echo what everybody else has said today. Um, we have a crisis in the schools and you know, I don't know if, I know some of you know the importance and the urgency of what we have to work with, but um, the things that are happening are, are happening at an alarming rate. There was issues before the pandemic, but the pandemic has created 
even more problems, you know, with the mental health, the staff shortages, um, the workloads. So um, again, my name is Kelly Gibbons. I am the executive director of SEIU Local 284. I represent approximately 9,000 school service employees, uh, ranging from school bus drivers, uh, all the hourly support people, the bus drivers, the food service, the custodians, paras, and then all the way up to higher ed, we have adjunct professors also. Our local is working for a future where students in Minnesota schools have everything they need to succeed from pre-K to career. Our top priorities for the session is unemployment insurance. And for those of you who know me, I have been talking about unemployment insurance for 22 years. I know. <laughs> I'm exhausted and I'm patient, but this is ridiculous. Um, I too was a school bus driver also, and I come from a long history of school bus drivers, all the way from my great grandpa to my mom and my sisters and uncles. And we never could understand why we didn't get unemployment. You know, they use terms like, well, you have to be laid off. You're not laid off. You have reasonable assurance that you will have a job the next year. But technically, you are laid off for three months. You have no income, no way to support your family. A lot of people in this profession are women and people of color. And a lot of us were single women raising children with no other help. I had three children, I was a single mom, and I was very creative on trying to support my family, but there was days I would cry, not knowing how I was gonna feed those kids. That's a huge burden on the backs of workers. And so when we go fast forward 22 years and we go through a huge pandemic, now again, we still have a staffing crisis, and it's not different, it's more. If you go on social media and you look at Robbinsdale or Richfield school districts or you know West St. Paul, all the different school districts, if you go on those social media pages, you will see that parents are trying to manage how to get their kiddos to school. They don't have the buses. Somebody who drives a school bus has to retain a commercial driver's license and a school bus endorsement and pass a physical. And that license goes with you every single day. And in order to get that job, you have to be 10 years free of any infractions on your driver's license. It is a very valuable resource for school districts to be able to have school bus drivers and get those kiddos to school. And they're the first people who see the kids and bring them to school. So not only do they serve the general education public, but they also take in, you know, drive the special needs students, which was something that I did and cherished, but I left the school district myself in search of full-time work. So I am the example of every other worker out there that we're talking about today. And so I wanted you to understand who I am and what I do because right now I'm the executive director of the Service Employees International Union, but I got involved in the union because of trying to fight for unemployment. It's a safety net for workers. I believe, I, I believe, and I think the members believe, because we've had multiple members testify over the last few years for unemployment, that it would be a safety net and a way to attract and retain employees. And not only for bus drivers, for paraprofessionals. They also work nine months out of the year. They, you know, to try to find and manage to get different jobs through the summer, nobody wants to hire you. It's just the reality. Mm -hmm. Why, as an employer, would I want to hire you if you're only going to stay for two, three months? That's a cost to them, and it's a cost to the school districts. There's going to be many people who will come here and say they can't afford to pay for unemployment. Every business I know, including my own, we have to pay unemployment insurance to the state, even though my workers rarely will ever have to access it. 
but it's the cost of doing business. Public schools are a business. They are an employer. They employ hourly people who technically get laid off for three months out of the year every single year. There's not really a guarantee that they have a job the next year. A lot of times they'll get laid off when budgets cut and they do their budget, they'll let people go. So, sorry, I'm a little off script, but I want you to understand that these folks are, are not able to continue to stay in the jobs that they're doing. We had 10,000 members. We continually lose members because they're not staying in these positions anymore. Our membership is hovering between seven and 9,000 members because that's how big the churn is. And these schools have multiple openings, multiple openings. So for the food service, they are running short staffed. These jobs are not the same jobs that they used to be back in the day when a mom came to work for just a little pocket change in their pockets. These are real professions that they care deeply about. Food services running short staffed. Um, they are so stressed out. It's extremely hard work. I don't know, if, you know, I know some of you are teachers, but I, if you've never worked in a kitchen, which I have, it is extremely hard work and it's fast paced work and you don't have much time to get those students in and out, in and out, in and out. Ms. And Gibbons, could we could I make just it faster? have you take a break for a yes, minute and yes. let uh, Ms. Tinney speak? We have about Abs five minutes absolutely. left. Thank I'm you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Kunish. Um, and members, my name is Beverly Tinney and I retired a year ago from the Malzieu School District after 17 years as a paraeducator in a federal level three ASD program. Right now I'm working with SEIU, Local 284, because um, mm -hmm. I really believe in what we do. And I work as a member engagement coordinator. And as such, I have the opportunity to go to school districts throughout the, the state and talk to paras. And in addition to the unemployment issue, which is enormous, um, I get to hear the same concerns again and again across the state. Um, staff shortages, lack of training, and inadequate time set aside for prep. I want to thank you for inviting us here so that we can talk about this. When paraeducators must deal with classrooms where there are insufficient paras to meet the needs of the students, both the students and the staff suffer. Often, because of low staffing, one para needs to cover two classrooms or more. This, you, this is, makes it very difficult to meet the needs of those students, or I would say nearly impossible to do so. Consistency is very important for our students, for all students, but especially in special ed. When staff schedules change daily because there's not enough staff and schedules need to be juggled, it's really hard on students and it's hard on staff. I asked for some examples from our members and um, I was overwhelmed <laughs> with the number of them, but I would like to share one. Um, and this is from a member who's a single working mother. Every year, my child has had to get new paras. They leave for higher paying jobs at the end of the school year, sometimes in the middle of the school year. It takes a long time building a relationship, and he relies on trusted adults for support. It takes weeks for a new staff and my son to get comfortable. Our school is chronically understaffed to levels that prohibit the full implement of my son's IEP. He's often not receiving the one-to-one -one student support due to lack of support. He's sometimes even receiving no support at all. Uh, he needs the support to access his education. He gets quite anxious uh, during these moments when he lacks support, and this means that really he can't focus on his learning. Last fall, my son's federal setting three ASD program began the school year with only two out of four of their required para staff positions. This led to my son's IEP not being followed. He was not given his sensory breaks that is guaranteed by his IEP, and that led to some very hard days. Last fall, my son's special education teacher went on paternity leave for three weeks. The school was already short-staffed with paras, excuse me, which was a really tough situation for everyone. Um, the substitute teacher quit at the end of the second week, citing difficulties managing the federal setting three ASD classroom with limited staff support, with very limited para support. 
the school did not have an alternative substitute and called each family of the students in my son's ASD classroom and told us that they would not have a sub the following week. They explained that it would mean not being able to follow anyone's IEP or schedule and they offered us for us to have our students stay home for one week with excused absence. My son literally did not have access to his education at all for an entire week in September. He was home with me and was sad missing school and his friends. He also had to come with me to drop off his sibling daily and it was awful. When the sped teacher returned, it took several more weeks for him to get back into a groove at school. If there had been adequate staffing from the beginning of the year, my son would not have had to spend weeks adjusting to the school year. It was unbelievable to experience this as his mother and I feel like families like ours were left behind. This not only impacts the student and the learning, but it, um, it makes situations in school not safe. When there aren't enough carers, not only are academic and social development needs not met, but safety becomes an issue for both students and staff. Um, some special ed para educators use large pieces of equipment like Hoyers or standers in order to get their students moved from one area to the other. This is really, these are really two person pieces of equipment. When you have one person there, it puts every, everyone at risk, both, both the um, student and also, and also the staff. Too often in schools across Minnesota, paraeducators are asked to learn on the job how to support these of our most vulnerable students. They're thrown into situations without knowing the strategies and support that works best with students. Many professions require ongoing professional development because it provides the opportunity to learn and practice. You get to reflect on new strategies, to add new skills, to hone your existing skills. Paraeducators need these opportunities also. We say we work from the heart and our hearts ache when we're not adequately prepared. With each school year, we see a wider and wider range of student needs and more students who need support. Special education paras work in classroom situations which always have the potential for volatile and unpredictable behaviors. We need training in de-escalation strategies and a host of other issues such as informed trauma practices, multicultural issues, just to name two. For years, SAIU and Education Minnesota have been fighting for 20 years of paid training for paras. 20 hours of paid training would make an enormous difference in the work lives of paras and also in the lives of our students. Ms. Tinney, I think we have to wrap it up. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I <laughs> okay. have to use I my I time management <laughs> much, much, much better. But I want to thank both of you again for coming in and sharing with us those, uh, the struggles, the things that, that um, our paras and our hourly workers are struggling with. And I'm sure we will hear from you again this, uh, this session. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your time. Um, members, we will um, be done here in just a minute. But tomorrow we have a full schedule of students from around the state who are going to be joining us in person as well as Zoom. We will begin at 8.30 sharp. So I would like you to be in your seats prior to 8.30. I will hit the gavel at 8.30 and um, we'll be hearing from uh, kids all across the state. And I'm very excited. Thank you for those of you that have invited students. And with that, we are adjourned.